Welcome to the Not Old Better Show. I'm Paul Vogelzang, and this is episode number 215. As part of our Art of Living series, we're going to talk about not dying today. I do not mean to be flip about this, as this show is an important one about the new guidelines for prostate diagnosis and detection. Prostate diagnosis has now been updated. Men and those of you with men in your lives, pay attention. Yesterday, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the USPSTF, issued new prostate cancer screening guidelines that take a less aggressive stance than in previous years and suggest a more nuanced risks versus harms approach to whether men should have a prostate-specific antigen, or known as a PSA, test, compared with the U.S. PSTF's earlier recommendation, which was issued in May of 2012, which advised against PSA-based screening in any men. In advising against PS-based screening, the USPSTF, a government-sponsored but independent network of national experts in disease prevention and evidence-based medicine, said that PSA testing produced more harm than good. They stopped recommending it at all. Now, that same group has finalized a tweak on those 2012 screening guidelines. Instead of bypassing PSA entirely, men ages 55 to 69 should have a conversation with their physician about the risks and benefits before making their own decision on whether or not to get screened. In advising against PSA-based screening, the USPSTF said, and I quote here from the study, there is moderate or high certainty that the service has no net benefit or that the harms outweigh the benefits. The new guidelines published online May 8th in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, are a marked departure from this position. Screening for prostate cancer, which is done via the PSA blood test, has been a source of some controversy for years. Some say the screening is not accurate enough and can cause harm via false positive results and lead to identifying and overtreating indolent cases of slow-growing prostate cancer that would never prove life-threatening. Proponents, who include some leading prostate cancer physicians, argue that the tools are still the best available to catch more aggressive prostate cancers earlier. After the 2012 recommendations were made public, an extensive comment period occurred, which, when you go to the USPSTF website today, you see we are in another comment period now. Well, many critics contended that there was no place for blanket recommendations or a one-size-fits-all recommendation. The new, softer stance from the USPSTF acknowledges that factors other than evidence were in play, including men's different tolerance for risk. If a man is more worried about getting prostate cancer and doesn't care much about harms, the decision will be weighted to getting screened, said Dr. Alexander Christ, the task force co-chair and the co-director of the Ambulatory Care Outcomes Research Network at Virginia Commonwealth University, right here in Richmond, Virginia. If he is less worried about cancer and is concerned about potential harms such as overuse, overdiagnosis, and bad treatment effects, he might choose against screening, says Dr. Christ. What's more, there are ways to reduce the potential harm caused by overdiagnosis, including increased use of active surveillance in which a prostate cancer that is deemed low risk is watched carefully rather than treated aggressively. Dr. Alex Christ goes on to say, extended follow-up of up to 10 plus years in these studies, which was not available in 2012, contributed heavily to the decision to modify the recommendations again available yesterday. The extended follow-up showed some men's lives would be saved if they chose to be screened between the ages of 55 to 69, which, by the way, tends to be the balance of the men who listen to the Not Old Better show. Of note now, though, the committee still finds screening for men over the age of 70 to be inappropriate. The evidence still suggests more harm than benefit in this age group. The committee pointed to research on some populations which may be at higher risk for prostate cancer and death from it. 
the incidence is 74% greater in African American men compared to white men. Having a family history of prostate cancer is also a known risk factor for developing the disease. Prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in men and the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. In 2018, an estimated 165,000 men will be diagnosed and 29,000 men will die from prostate cancer. The controversy over prostate cancer screening is because of the blood test developed in the late 1980s looking for PSA. PSA can be elevated when prostate cancer is present, but can also be elevated for a number of other reasons, inflammation or infection, that generate an awful lot of false positives. The problem with false positives is that in order to confirm prostate cancer, a patient has to undergo a biopsy. Biopsies have side effects such as pain, infection, and bleeding. Even when cancer is present, 20 to 50% of prostate cancers never grow, spread, or cause any harm to the patient, but doctors cannot tell which ones are harmful and which ones are harmless. Treatment also has side effects, and evidence shows that one in five men who undergo prostate surgery will have long-term urinary incontinence, and two out of three men will have long-term erectile dysfunction. The overall message from USPSTF, according to Dr. Christ, is that they recognize this is a complex decision. There is no right answer, says Dr. Christ. We know a few men will benefit from screening. We know many men will have harm from screening. It depends on what these men value, and having a conversation with their physician is an important process of whether screening is right for them. The U.S. PSTF recognizes these recommendations are likely to be confusing for both patients and medical providers. Therefore, the U.S. PSTF have set up a very user-friendly website called Screening for Prostate Cancer at screeningforprostatecancer.org for those interested in educating themselves about prostate cancer and the new recommendations. So check that out. And of course, we'll offer links to the site in our show notes today. Also today, I want to revisit a prostate cancer-related interview I did two years ago with Dr. Paul Steinberg, who's credited with being the longest-known metastatic prostate cancer survivor. Dr. Steinberg has written a book about his prostate cancer journey titled The Salamander's Tale, and that's tale spelled T-A-L-E. As you will hear from Paul, and I've asked him to read the prologue and then the epilogue, which is still ongoing, as a matter of fact, you'll learn and you'll hear in Dr. Steinberg's own voice that Dr. Steinberg's memoir is frank and engaging about his 30-year battle with prostate cancer and his own journey from physician, he's an MD, to patient after he was diagnosed when he made the determination that in order to survive, he needed to discard the statistics and make his own personal anecdote paramount. The result of which is both his survival, and fortunately for us, his book, again, The Salamander's Tale. He subsequently became an empowered patient questioning the nature of what medicine knows about prostate cancer. And he also becomes a sort of philosopher, a patient meditating on the meaning of life, sex, and the horrifying possibility of castration. Yes, castration. Prostate cancer created a new reality for him. Again, in his words, a kind of salvation, redemption, and regeneration. Dr. Steinberg is a psychiatrist who practices in the Washington, D.C. area, and his work has appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post. So, um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the, uh, from the prologue um, and give you a sense of uh, what uh, I was dealing with. Uh, uh, this goes back about 25 years ago just to uh, 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 surgery and radiation were in 84, 85. But here's the prologue. The punishment the chopping off of my balls, a literal castration, the crime, none, at least none I'm aware of. I am not a rapist, let alone a serial rapist. I am not a pedophile. I am not a sex addict. Yes, I do enjoy sex. I am not the greatest lover, but I am not the worst. I am good enough. 
It is December 1989, and the self-appointed executioner of my love life is talking to me over the phone from New York City. I am in Washington, D.C. He is telling me what any self-respecting man would dread to hear. You need to have your testicles removed. It will save your life. You will die a quick and painful death if you do not undergo a castration. But wait, what about my very essence, my very spirit as a man, as a human being? Is this a new concept? Cut off your balls to save your face? Your testicles are your life, not unlike the choice given to Jack Benny by a mugger. Your money or your life, shouted the mugger to the notoriously cheapskate comedian. Benny stood there paralyzed, unable to choose. Likewise, my own paralysis. Doesn't existence lay too much on us? Can existence burden us with any more stark a choice? I can easily imagine the potential executioners of my orgasms sitting at, a, at rounds at a hospital in Manhattan discussing my case. The patient is a 41-year-old white married male psychiatrist living in Washington, D.C. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer five years ago and underwent a radical prostatectomy here at our hospital on October 5, 1984. We thought we got it all, every bit of cancerous tissue. To be on the safe side, we had the patient go through six weeks of radiation to the prostate bed in order to eliminate any remaining cancer cells in that area. Unfortunately, there is evidence the cancer has returned. A new test, the prostate-specific antigen, we all know it now, it's uh, ubiquitous, but that was a new test back in 88, 89. Available at this hospital for the past 18 months has shown a gradual rise from 0.6 in 1988 to 2.1 this December. The only source of this antigen has to be cancer cells since his prostate has been completely removed. In a relatively young man like this, with a terribly aggressive disease, the only option is castration. Testosterone fuels the growth of these prostate cancer cells. It is urgent and essential that we eliminate all testosterone from this man's body as quickly as possible. And the most ex expeditious way to do so is by surgical castration over my dead body. Those facts do not tell the full story. They leave out a ton of desire. Where are the yearnings, the struggles, and strivings in this doctorly narrative? Where is the mere mention of the orgasm? Yes, the orgasm. Can there be any more pleasurable experience in a man's or woman's life? Admittedly, food and other pleasures can approach the or orgasmic, but there is nothing like the real thing, the real deal. Lust, libido, orgasm. The gods have set it up so that our most vital function, procreation, the survival of the species, the passing on of our genes, is suffused with the most unsubtle of pleasures. As if our instinct to replicate ourselves were not enough, the gods lured us with the promise of an exultant explosion of ecstasy, a momentary pleasure certainly, but one that with the prospect of repeated paroxysms can give us a self-assuredness that lasts a seeming lifetime. Back in the early and mid-20th century, the German psychiatrist Wilhelm Reich claimed that without the orgasm, we all would get cancer and we would shrivel up and die. On some level, the former protege of Sigmund Freud was simply trying to overcome the sexual repressiveness of Europe and the United States in the 19th and early 20th century. Accused of fraud for the promotion of his seemingly useless orgone box, Reich was even willing to go to prison. In fact, he died in the Lewisburg, Pennsylvania penitentiary, attempting to promote the worth of the orgasm. So here I was, facing the executioner of my orgasms. Although he delivered my sentence in a somber tone, I could not help but wonder how much unacknowledged sadism was involved in this pronouncement. As a physician myself, I knew all too well how much sadism exists in the helping professions. Just as there is a thin line between love and hate, there's also a thin line between helping and hurting, between public safety and public endangerment. Cops and criminals, doctors and patients, lovers and haters, sometimes it is difficult to tell the difference. In medical training, the dividing point takes place early in the first clinical rotation during the third year of medical school. The class separates almost in half, the skittish and squeamish versus the unaffected and undaunted. The first two years of medical school are not unlike the previous 16 years of schooling that most of us have gone through. Lots of book learning, studying, and more studying. 
Even the limited clinical training, the non-book learning in the first two years of medical school is rather benign, concentrating on learning how to listen to heart sounds and lung sounds, how to look at blood vessels in the eyes, and most importantly, how to interview people and get a history of their current problems. But this all changes with the onset of rotations in pediatrics, internal medicine, surgery, and obstetrics and gynecology. Suddenly, we're asked to poke and prod, stick and stab our patients, whether they are infants or octogenarians. By the second day of whatever clinical rotation we've, we have been assigned to, we can see the impact of that first day of orientation. Half the class strides confidently off the elevator, unable to contain their enthusiasm for the opportunity to poke and prod. The other half leaves the elevator cautiously, wondering what the hell they've gotten themselves into. Somehow they, or I should say we, since I was one of this group, thought we were going to be helping people. Instead, we were using fellow human beings as experimental fodder, stabbing them with needles 10 or 20 times in order to take blood or insert IVs. As students, we could easily pick out the super sadists, the ones who immediately volunteered to do the lumbar punctures and any other invasive procedures. The spinal tap requires that you insert a needle the size of an ice pick into someone's back. A slight change in context, and for that same act, you're sitting in a courtroom facing a sentence of at least three to five years. Tubes put into people's urethras, cold hard speculums up vaginas, sigmoidoscopes up rectums into descending colons. In the early 1970s, before the advent of flexible fiber optic instruments, we had only rigid instruments, all the better to inflict pain and discomfort. Soon enough, we lost track of our humanity. Even those of us who had started out skittish and squeamish became detached from the impact of what we were doing. Is this what had happened to the urologist in New York City who was matter-of-factly sentencing me to castration? Come up to New York City and we'll cut off your balls. Was this a playground threat or trash talking or bluster from a mafia hitman? I told myself there had to be another way to contain and control prostate cancer. I then asked Paul to read a little bit more and this time from the epilogue of the book, as I mentioned, just uh, just in the introduction. So I'm going to read uh, a final note. Okay, yeah, um, that's great. Thank you. And I start off with a uh, quote from uh, Jess Walters, who uh, wrote a uh, book noir, if you will, uh, called Citizen Vince. Not a great book, but there's one uh, uh, paragraph in the middle of it uh, that's pretty amazing, and I'll just uh, read that and then read uh, my... Uh, final note. A book can only end in one of two ways, truthfully or artfully. If it ends artfully, then it never feels quite right. It feels forced, manipulated. If it ends truthfully, then the story ends badly, in death. Life itself always ends badly. Fortunately, all of us are alive. I'm alive, so uh, we can ce again celebrate that, as I mentioned. Many of us die a quick death, a heart attack, a stroke, our heads severed in an automobile accident, whatever. Even cancers can lead to a precipitous death. Think pancreatic cancer and melanoma. But for those of us with prostate cancer, we live and die on the installment plan, a slow slog of a slaying. We lose our lust and libido, then gain it back. We lose our lust for life, then gain it back. We get bone metastases and get rid of them by an androgen blockade or through radiation. We do likewise with lung metastases and even brain metastases. We go through rehearsal after rehearsal for our own deaths. We practice and practice. We face a death sentence over and over again. Then we get reprieves. We escape the clutches of death until we no longer can escape. The lords of the kitchen normally boil the water first and then put the crabs, you can choose lobsters if you like, into the hot steamy water. The crabs do not know what hit them. They die a quick, precipitous death. But for crabs like myself, the lords have put us into water at room temperature and then have turned up the heat. We recognize what is happening and we hightail out of the pot. The lords gather us up again and put us back into the pot. The water is a bit warmer now. We know we can still escape and we do so. The next time the water is hotter still, we keep escaping, but we now know the end is nigh. But we deny the nighness. Ah, denial. Denial. N-I-L-E. 
Yes, the biggest river in Africa. We make jokes about denial. We deny we're in denial. Those who die precipitously cling to their denial right up until their precipitous death. It is beyond their imagination. Not sick even for one day in my life, they say. I've got the reaper covered. He has nothing on me. I work out every day. I play tennis or basketball. I run practically every day. For those of us dying on the installment plan, we keep managing our escapes. We keep finding escape routes, and we keep assuming the new hatches will open. It goes without saying that we live ultimately to die, but when facing the rapidly boiling water, we are dying to live. Our denial of death allows us to extract every ounce of power and creativity out of every moment. No, I am not helpless. I can escape from that torrid water a third time, a sixth time. Feverish, slowed hopelessly by the heat, I still push forward. I grab the edge of the pot with my claws. I still out, hold out hope. I will still make my escape. My thanks to Dr. Paul Steinberg and his willingness to read from his book, A Salamander's Tale. Again, we'll put links to everything up on the website. My thanks to all of you, the listeners, for paying attention today, for your willingness to be an ongoing part of the Not Old Better show. I'm grateful for that. And I am always grateful for your emails. Thanks very much for sending those to me and for your wonderful show suggestions, as well as your feedback. You can always send that to info at notold-better.com. Thanks very much, everybody. And remember, our next show is going to be a great one. Talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. Thank you. Thank you.